Hello everybody, welcome to part seven of our reading of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Once more, if this is your first time on the channel, welcome. We're so happy that you are here, but you might want to go back and start from the beginning. Again, every Tuesday from 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time, I am live on the Dark Outpost platform, the Dark Outpost TV, reading through the Yoga Sutras in the first hour, and in the second hour, we are going through some of the very toxic fundamentalist church organizations here in the United States. For those who have been on this channel for a while now, you know that I do do a recap on Wednesdays over what we discussed on Tuesday with David Zublick. Normally the first hour is us going through the missing books of the Bible, which we have gone through quite a few. And if that is something that you are interested in, there is a link down in the description box to the Dark Outpost playlist so you can go through some of those missing books of the Bible. Of course, many of you know that it was David Zublick's idea to start to go through the Yoga Sutras. This is because I myself am the only female authorized by KPJAYI in Mysore, India, to teach Ashtanga Yoga here in the state of Georgia. And I personally have gotten a lot of kickback from very brainwashed, mind-controlled fundamentalist groups in the Christian world. And a lot of what they believe about yoga is simply not true. And so for us to use our critical thinking skills, we obviously need to read through the material to understand what yoga really is. Of course, many of you know that yoga is an exercise of really learning how to understand your own mind and you yourself controlling your own mind and your own thoughts. We know from past readings through the Yoga Sutras in the first part of the first book that Patanjali tells us that yoga is yoga chitta vritti nirodaha that it is ceasing the thoughts in order to find the nothingness. And so once you find that nothingness, you, you can then be filled with the Spirit of God. We know from going through this commentary on the Yoga Sutras, and I know from being an avid yoga student and teacher of yoga, that part of yoga is full surrender to God. And if you joined us last week, especially on the Dark Outpost, we did speak a lot about that, that anytime you have anxiety or fears, that's a way for you to observe yourself and understand that at that moment of your anxiety and your fear, you are not actually surrendering to God. Because if you were in total surrender to the divine, then there would be no fear or anxiety. And so that is why it's super important for us to read through all of these old texts to have a better understanding of maybe where we've been misled about certain ideas. We know that the church, yes, all churches are part of the cabal. They're part of the satanic programming. Whether they know it or not, there are a lot of really good preachers out there that just have no idea that they're being controlled and puppeted by this group of nefarious people. Again, follow the money, follow the money through seminary schools, everything like that. And so if your pastor or if anybody in your church has told you yoga is satanic, then they are lying to you. They are trying to mind control you and are trying to divide people, not unify them. Now again, we started with the first pada. Uh, we're reading right from the beginning, and that is that was the Samadhi pada. And now we're in the second pada, which is the Sadhana pada. As I've said many, many times before, and as I really want to emphasize, if you are going to study the Yoga Sutras in a more traditional setting, your teacher will, will most likely start with the second pada, the sadhana pada. And that is because the second pada involves the physical practice. And as human beings, our physical body is what we understand the most. And then later you will go back and read the first pada, which is the samadhi pada. Samadhi means oneness with God and sadhana means a devotional practice. Last week we left off at the sixth sutra of the second pada and that is where we are gonna pick up again today. We're not gonna read as many sutras today because we're still quite a bit behind um, in the dark outpost and there's a lot to discuss when it comes to all these sutras. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with the sixth Sutra of the Yoga Sutras in the second pada, the sadhana pada. And once again, before we get started, just to remind you guys, I am reading from Sri Swami Sachitananda's commentary on the Yoga Sutras. It's one of the most popular commentaries, but of course there are a lot of different commentaries. I will put a link to the sutras down in the description box below. 
So Sutra 6 says, Egoism is the identification, as it were, of the power of the seer, Purusha, with that of the instrument of the seeing body-mind. So again, just to remind you guys, we have three players here in the Yoga Sutras. We have Purusha, which is like the soul. We have Prakriti, which is nature, and we have Ishvara, which is God. In this sutra, Patanjali explains egoism. The ego is the reflection of the true self on the mind. The two appear to be the same, but one is the original and the other is a reflected duplicate. The self will always be falsely represented by the ego until our ignorance is removed. I often refer to these two eyes as the little eye and the capital I. What is the difference? Just a small dot, a little blemish of ego. The capital I is just one pure stroke, just as the highest truth is always simple and pure. What limits us and makes us little? Just the dot. Without the dot, we are always great, always the capital I. All the practices of yoga are just to remove that dot. How simple is it? All the difficulties and the turmoils can be removed from our lives in no time, just by taking away that spot. But preparation for that is what takes time. Many times we climb up only to slip down. Sometimes we get all the way up there only to find we have forgotten to take along an eraser to wipe off the dot. So we have to come back down again. So again, ego is a big conversation piece in the yoga practice because a lot of ego is not the true self. And it also, also ego can come back to a place of fear Fear of our own mortality, fear of not mattering, and when you feel like you have to push your ego out there, you are again showing yourself where you are not trusting and surrendering to God. In the pure state of yourself, in your pure self, in your soul, and Purusha, there is no ego. There is no competition. You are whole and you are complete. Anytime we see an abundance of ego, we see where there is an imbalance within the person's perception of themselves. All right, sutra number seven. Attachment is what follows identification with pleasurable experiences. So that makes sense, right? Attachment is that which follows identification with pleasurable experiences. The ego is always looking for pleasure. And if you remember from last week, we kicked off the second pada with Patanjali, the writer of the sutras, telling us how necessary pain is. And if you've been involved in any type of traditional spiritual practice, you know that pain is necessary, pain is real, and pain is also humbling. We have to experience that rock bottom humbling pain in order to then ascend up through the true self, not through the ego. So sutra number eight, aversion is that which follows identification with painful experiences. So now we're saying the ego likes the pleasurable experience and is going to start to avert from painful experiences, which once again was covered in the first sutra of this pada. So Sri Swami Sachidananda goes on to say, attachment to pleasure or raja is another pain-bearing obstacle. We attach ourselves to pleasures because we expect happiness from it, forgetting that happiness is always in us as the true self. When we expect joy from outside things, we become attached to those things. If we find these things that make us unhappy, we create an inversion towards them. So likes and dislikes are implements of the spiritual path. One we like because it seems to bring happiness. The other we dislike because it seems to bring unhappiness. Everyone wants to be happy. Is there anything we can think of that doesn't? Even a small worm put in the sun immediately rolls towards the shade. If we put a plant indoors, it will slowly turn its face towards the light because it too wants to be happy. Happiness seems to be the basic of everything in this world, yet rarely does anybody find it. Why? Because happiness is like the musk deer. The ancient scriptures have a fable about this animal, which has a scented spot above its forehead that gives off the musk fragrance. This deer runs here and there in search of the scent, not knowing that the scent comes from its own forehead. Just like that, happiness is already in us. Wherever we go, we reflect our happiness onto people and things. When we see a smiling face and feel happy, it is because the smiling face reflects our happiness. Just as a pure, clean mirror reflects our face beautifully, certain pure, clean faces reflect our own happiness. 
then we say she gives me happiness and other faces our happiness reflects in a distorted way and we say I don't like that person it is absolute nonsense no one can ever give us happiness or unhappiness but can only reflect or distort our own inner happiness and Shanti from Aquarius Rising Africa, who's also studied in, uh, yoga in India as well, talks a lot about this, that everything that is triggered in us is only coming from ourself. So if we go back to the ego, anytime you feel your ego rising, it's because you are distorted, not because of the person giving that need to you to create an ego. You then have to settle within yourself and figure out why you're being triggered like that. All right, let's go to Sutra 9. Clinging to life flowing by its own potency due to past experience, exists even in the wise. The next obstacle is clinging to life. Here we can get a clue to the nature of rebirth also. Many Westerners don't believe in reincarnation. They feel it's all over once we die. But the yoga philosophy reminds us that all of our knowledge comes through experience. Without experience, we cannot understand or learn anything. Even books can only remind us of something we have experienced in the past. They help kindle a fire that is already in us. That fire must be there first for the kindling to stick to kindle it. For example, have you ever experienced a sapodilla fruit? It is abundant in Bombay in certain seasons and is very soft and tasty. But even if I spend three hours explaining a sapodilla fruit and how it tastes, you are not going to understand it because you have never experienced it. Knowledge comes only through experience. If you allow a baby to crawl on a tabletop as it comes to the edge and is about to fall, it will yell. Why? Out of fear of falling and dying. How come fear of death come into the mind of the baby? He can only fear death if he has died before. Some might say that is just instinct. But what does instinct mean? Yoga says instincts is a trace of an old experience that has been repeated many times and the impressions that have sunk down to the bottom of the mental lake. Although they go down, they aren't completely erased. Don't think you ever forget anything. All experiences are stored in the chitta, or the brain. And when proper atmosphere is created, they come to the surface again. When we do something several times, it forms a habit. Continue with that habit for a long time and it becomes our character. Continue with that character and eventually, perhaps in another life, it comes up as instinct. Many of you might play the guitar. When you first learn, you might have even marked the notes right on the guitar to get the proper finger position. Each time you played, you checked to see which strings should be manipulated. But after a few months, you became proficient and even could talk to someone and play at the same time without looking or thinking about it. How? The experience becomes habit and eventually the habit becomes your character. Probably in another birth, you might easily pick up guitar playing without much effort. Don't people say, oh, she's a born guitarist? In the same way, all of our instincts are, were once experiences. That's why fear of death exists. We have died hundreds and thousands of times. We know well the pain of death. And so the moment we get into a body, we love it so much that we are afraid to leave it and go forward because we have sensational attachment to it. Some people have old, old cars, a 43 Dodge. Even if you offer them the latest model Dodge, they won't, they won't want it. You may even say your car is no good anymore. You are blocking the road by driving it at 10 miles an hour when everybody else is going 55. You need a new one. Get a new one. The motor vehicle department may even take it away by force and throw it in a junkyard, but the owner will still sit by it crying and laminating. Attachment to the body is like the attachment to the car. God's government regulations say that if your old body is taken away by force, they must give you a new one. Many people do not know this and cling to the body even when it gets old and dilapidated. That constant clinging, breaking away, clinging again, breaking away, is why we are mortally afraid of death. It is another klesha based on ignorance of our true nature. So all these klashas, whether dormant, feeble, interceptive, or sustainable, should always be gotten rid of. Only then are we ready to go further. So again, attachment to the body, attachment to property is a huge obstacle in our spiritual development. And as Richard Freeman has said many times before, the practice of yoga is literally a practice in your own mortality. This brings us to Sutra number 10. In subtle form, these obstacles can be destroyed by resolving them back into their primal cause, the ego. Sutra 11. In the active state, they can be destroyed by meditation. 
The hindering thoughts come in two stages, the potential form before they come to the surface and get converted to action, and the manifesting ones which are being put into action. It is easier to control manifesting things first. Then from the more gross, we can slowly get into the more subtle. We discussed that in the first pada as well. Thought forms in a potential state, samskaras, cannot be removed by meditation. So samskaras can also be described as like a broken record, like when a record skips. That's a samskara. We all have samskaras. We all have these repetitive thoughts, these, these repetitive habits that go over and over and over again that we need to eventually correct. When you meditate on these impressions, you bring them to the surface. You can't destroy them by this means, but you can see and understand them well and gain control over whether or not they should manifest in action. So again, it's kind of like uh, AA meetings. Like the first thing you have to do is admit you have a problem. So the first thing that the yoga practice is going to show you is where your samskaras are. So you can become aware of them and when they pop up, you can start to recognize them for what they are as merely samskaras. You could trace them back into their subtle form and see directly that the ego is the base for all these obstructing thoughts. Then, when you transcend the mind and get the higher samadhi, even the ego is lost. When you let go of the ego, all the impressions in it will be lost also. But until that occurs, the impressions will not go away. It is something like using herbs. An herb is a product that aids digestion and helps con control gas. In India, it is used in curries and kept in a mud pot, but it smells so much that even if you clean the pot hundreds of times, the smell will, sit, will stay. How can you get rid of the smell? The only way is to break the pot. The ego has the smell of your thoughts in the very subtle form, but you can only understand the smell and see the thoughts are there when they are manifested. To get rid of the impressions completely, you have to break the ego. So first you can, play, you can clean the superficial things and ultimately you break the pot. By meditation, you can understand the thought forms and clean them up. Then when you have gotten a glimpse of where and how they are, you can slowly trace them to their roots and finally cut it out. But when you want to uproot a tree, you cut the branches first and then dig into the very root. So I think that's good for today, guys. Like I said, this is going to be a quick one. And that seems like a good stopping point and a good place for everybody to kind of contemplate this next week over the ego and over the egoic thoughts and their samskaras and their rep repetition. And just as he just said, the way to combat the ego is to first recognize the thoughts formed by the ego, kind of like cutting the branches off a tree and then digging to the roots. All right, guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.